On that note, let's go ahead and go to Sam from Oakland, uh, California, uh, talking about your favorite space shuttle experiences. Uh, so, Sam, tell us first off, which is if you could pick, if you had to pick one, which would your favorite orbiter be? <laughs> oh, they had to ask the tough one. Okay, uh, can you guys see me? Yes, and it, it, if I didn't know better, I would say you were on the orbiter right now. <laughs> I'm floating, floating. <laughs> I know what it looks like. Yeah, um, I guess I would say my favorite orbiter would be the Endeavor because I actually got to walk through it. Uh, many, many, many moons ago, I worked at the Kennedy Space Center. I was on uh, working for McDonnell Douglas and had an opportunity to actually uh, get in one of those little, uh, they call them the bunny suits, the clean room suits. So I was covered head to toe with the, you know, the clean gear so you don't get anything dirty, no hair follicles, no nothing. You get on the, inside the space shuttle. And we crawled inside this little narrow tunnel, which is, of course, the entranceway on the side of the shuttle to get inside. And then we went up to um, – excuse me, I have a cat here. <laughs> Say hi, Twinkle, to the whole cat. world. I heard, I heard it. It was a cat. There's a cat in space. Okay, it's following, it's floating around me. Can't you tell she's floating? Floating cat. Always bothering. Okay. Anyways, uh, anyways, uh, so anyways, in the bunny suit, crawling through the entrance to the to the, the, the mid deck, and then from there we crawled up into the flight deck. And everything you see on video on the space shuttle on the flight deck, they're using those fisheye lenses because that flight deck is really tiny. It's really really small. And uh, outside of being small, can you describe a little bit about what it was like to be inside of an orbiter? I mean, this Endeavor went to space and, and at, before and after you were on it. So, I mean, what was it like to be inside of an active spaceship? Well, uh, active is a strong word, but because it was on the ground. But you, you get the idea. This was uh, 94 or so, and this was like just before the maiden flight of Endeavor. So this, I got there before it actually was operational. So new and shiny. And, Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, so it's pretty shiny. Everything was all clean and sparkly new. Had the latest avionics equipment on it at the time. Um, so I was like one of the first people to actually tour around and see what was going on inside there uh, before the you know before the actual flight. So cool. So what was going on inside of the orbiter? I mean, I mean how, how, for someone who's never been inside of a space shuttle before and all they have are those fisheye pictures, how, how would you describe it? Other than, I mean, tiny, obviously, it was tiny, but... Yeah, I mean, living thing. Yeah, yeah. And cats running around. But, Sorry. But, yeah, so, but I, I mean, is it is it all levers and knobs? Is it... Uh, you know what I'm when, getting at? When they're, when, when they're working on the shuttle and they're assembling it, they're basically everything's like pull-out compartments, so they'll have like a... Uh, secure uh, knobs they can turn to pull out entire panels. So some of the panels were missing at the time, and they were doing uh, uh, testing and diagnostic work to make sure the different panels and controls were working. So everything's kind of modular. So they would pull things out, test things out, put it in. So there's a lot of the, the, the clean room uh, plastics all over the place, you know, static resistant plastics um, and other things to kind of, you know, keep everything clean and secure, clean while they were doing their testing. And the cat's back. Because, because you were in Endeavor, that makes Endeavor your, your favorite orbiter. What would be your favorite space experience overall, uh, was space shuttle memory? Uh, well, I, I saw about a dozen space shuttle flights when I was working there from uh, 1991 through 1995. And um, gosh, I don't know. One of the cool ones was I was actually – uh, got the opportunity to actually be standing on one of the secondary uh, launch platforms while watching a shuttle launch, you know, three miles away. So I'm already at a very high elevated position above all the trees. So there's no obstruction, no obstructed view whatsoever. And so I get to see the entire, you know, launch environment over there for the shuttle um, and get a perfect view. Dang. Yeah, that, so you were like, for example, one of the shuttles was at pad 39A, and you were then at pad 39B, is that what you're saying? No, no, no. Um, when, when, there's a, when there's one shuttle on the pad, there's usually, uh, there's, you know those platforms that go on top of the crawler? So I was on one of those platforms that was on, uh, the, on, on the crawler. Excuse me, cat. Pardon me one second. Get the cat out of the way. Stay. Uh, <laughs> 
Uh, so they have uh, a whole platform that they put the shuttle on, and that platform goes on the crawler, which crawls out at two miles an hour or one mile an hour to the pad. So we had a secondary one that was really close to the VAB, and that's the one that we were sitting on. Gotcha. Very cool. So it'd be like the, the mobile launcher that they've got now with the uh, for the whatever program. Um, <laughs> Which I said they should bring over here Instrument and let us program. all stand on. Actually, you did say that because there's this giant mobile mobile launcher sitting over there, blinking at us, and it doesn't it does it does nothing. You know, it's to launch insert rocket name here, and it's just sitting there. They might just roll it over the press site, give us all ladders, you know, climb up to the top of it. Would it save people a lot of time building these two story tents? Yeah, absolutely. A absolutely. <laughs> How did you originally become a space geek? Uh. Well, let's see. Uh, when my family moved to Orlando, Florida back in the 70s, uh, it was pretty much just a given that you would become a space geek because every day you're hearing something about space and the space shuttle and space station. And um, I always tell people that I was born in 1967, which was the second season of Star Trek, so that automatically makes me a space geek. <laughs> How much of, if you were born in 67... Uh, you were uh, we young uh, when Apollo first hit the moon. Do you remember much? Yeah, teeny tiny. Do you remember much of the Apollo era, or were you too young for that? Uh, I think it was all rather blurry at the time. I don't remember much. Very large. So really, I mean, you grew up with the shuttle like the rest of us. I mean, that that that's your your vehicle. I mean, that's our vehicle. So it, yeah, it's it's yours as well. How do you feel about it being retired at this point? Well, uh, there were a lot of emotional ups and downs with the shuttle. I was in college uh, uh, during when the Space Shuttle Challenger blew up. And, in fact, I remember the exact moment because I was actually home from class and I was doing my homework. And, of course, you know, it's like, okay, there's a shuttle launch. And it's like, should I bother going out? Because, literally, you know, when you're in Florida, you just look, go outside. The, you just walk outside. There's a launch. You see the, you see the giant plume of smoke going in the sky, and it's really cool. So I actually did that. I went outside, and it's like, that doesn't look right. And I immediately turned on the TV and realized what was going on. It was it was a pretty scary moment. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I, actually, I was in school. I remember much. I wasn't in Florida. I was, you know, watching on TV. And I think uh, that's the mem memory for most of us. Actually, I think I remember they cut away. Like I was watching, and then they cut to something else. Like we're done with that now. And then they cut back. Like oh, uh, something happened. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Our teachers cut it off. Yeah. Our teachers went, oh, was that's not right, turned it off. And they were like, okay, done. Huh. So I, I didn't see, I mean, at the time, I didn't know, I didn't understand. So it, it didn't, because mm -hmm. I wasn't interested enough to really pay attention to it to know that there was something wrong. But they were like, okay, good, it went, click. And that was it. And it wasn't until later that I, I realized wow. actually what had happened. So, if, Sam, if you had to give people, we've been asking all of our guests this, uh, if you had to give people who are passive space geeks uh, any advice to become an active space geek, say, you know, that, that's kind of cool, maybe I could get interested in it, um, but I'm not sure, is there, is there really a reason to do this? Do you, do you have any advice for those kind of people to say, you know, yeah, this is why you should become an active, an awesome space geek and, and tie into the space community? Well, as a very active space geek, um, I can give you lots of recommendations. Uh, number one, join the National Space Society. Number two, join the Space Frontier Foundation. Number three, get involved with the Space Tourism Society. Uh, number four, get involved with the maker movement. The biggest thing that's going on here, because I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, is the whole maker movement and tech shops and people actually building stuff. And there are a group of hackers in San Francisco that actually do balloon launches. They actually just got, they buy an old weather balloon off of eBay and they stuff a couple Android phones and a camera in a styrofoam box, took it on, attached it by a rope to the balloon, and they do weather balloon. They do balloon launches. Hackers, individuals, doesn't cost millions of dollars. Individuals can do stuff right now. There are actually kits you can get online, I think, that tell you, you know, this is all you need to do a balloon launch. Just insert your own electronics for whatever you want to record, and off you go. Right. Yeah, so, I mean, you can, and you can make your own. They give you the instructions, or yeah. you can kind of buy them as little itty bitty kits. And you can, I mean, that's, that's a really great piece of advice. You can go out and actually do something yourself. Now, I, I know you, Sam. I know Spaceman Sam. He's been to all kinds of crazy space things. Um, were, you were actually out at the, uh, the Spaceship One launches, correct? 
I was on the film crew with the X Prize Foundation. I was actually part of the X Prize Television Network. So I was photographing the entire event. Uh, I've been with X Prize, Space Frontier Foundation. I was on all three uh, uh, Spaceship One flights. Um, I want to show you a photograph of, uh, of me from my younger days. Ooh. Nostalgic time. Hang on tight. Uh, so I don't know if you can see this in the video. But this is a vehicle called the DCX, the Delta Clipper Experimental, which was the inspiration for a lot of these space companies that you hear about today. Because this was the world's first uh, fully reusable rocket ship. And the ideas that were developed, or the concepts that were developed from this, inspired companies like Armadillo Aerospace and SpaceX and Mast in Space and companies like that. Because of this brief moment in time where an actual government project was done, uh, on a very low cost in a very short uh, period of time. And I actually, you know, proof that I was actually on the team of this project back in 1993. That's so cool. You got the chat room going all, all bonkers over at DCX. They're like, woohoo! Yeah, hey, now, piece of history one, here. That could actually launch vertically and then land vertically again, couldn't it? That's exactly what it did. It did it 12 times. That's not, that's not something you, so to put that in perspective, imagine the space shuttle launching go vertically like it does now, going into space and then instead of landing horizontally like a plane, landing vertically right back on the very launch pad in which it launched from. I, that, that's what you're talking about. So I, uh, those vehicles didn't go as high as the shuttle. They, they, they only went a, a bit into the air, but uh, yeah, that, that, I mean, that, that's some really cool tech. Do you have any, by chance, do you have any other cool photos and stuff you can show off while, you're, while we got you? Uh, not right in front of me, but I can recommend my website because, uh, as many of you guys know, I do a lot of photography. And can I plug my website? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely by all means. So if you go to www.samsphotography.net, uh, you will see a lot of links to the Spaceship One photos and a lot of links to uh, photos from uh, the X Prize flights, the X Prize Cub. Uh, Space Frontier Foundation, a bunch of other events. I've been slowly trying to build a book up on all these space adventures I've been going over. Uh, I've been at this game for a really long time, so I've got photographs going way back for like 15 plus years. That's awesome. Where else can people find you online? Say Twitter, Facebook, stuff like that. Well, uh, Facebook, but you, you, people have based their name. So. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter uh, as Spaceman Sam. And I'm also on uh, Facebook. Just look up uh, Spaceman Sam or Sam Coniglio. I'm up there somewhere. Um, I'm a jack of all trades. You'll see me doing stuff related to Burning Man, space travel, uh, steampunk, all sorts of crazy stuff. So you'll see me all over the place. Sam, that's absolutely awesome. Any, any, uh, Tim, you know, so any follow-up questions? Uh, Sam really is a jack. I love following your Twitter feed because you always have such cool – different stuff on there. I mean, it's, it's space related, but when you see like steampunk space, it's a totally different spin on things. And it gives it such a different, um, fanciful and fun flavor that it's just, I, I, I love following all of your, uh, your exploits out there in California and with the whole maker society. It's so much fun to watch and learn what you can do on your own now that it doesn't take, we talk about it not taking a, a, a government. It just takes a big corporation. But I mean, what Sam's saying is you don't even need a big corporation. You go on eBay and buy your own weather balloon and send stuff into outer space. Come on, you, you, you measure it in, in your ten, basement. You measure it in tens of dollars instead of even hundreds or thousands of dollars. Right. But, you know, that, that's, it's just fun stuff. What a great way to get people excited, not just about space, but science as well. Yeah. Science, exactly. <laughs> the, the biggest challenge is that, you know, we're so used to, you know, we're all geeks. We all have computers. We sit in front of the darn machine all the time and we get lazy. And sometimes you just have to step away from the machine and get another machine, like a power tool or a drill, and, and get a project, get some people together to work with you, and make something. And, and I don't know what I'm doing half the time. I'm just trying to figure out, you know, how can I make this? And if I can't do it by myself, I get some friends. So um, another plug, if any of you are going to the Space Frontier Conference uh, early, later this month, the New Space Conference, uh, I'll be there, and I'll be bringing my friends and... The Cosmobot, if any of you remember the Cosmobot, the drink bot, which I built with the help of some engineer friends, which is a cocktail making robot. Before, yeah, you got to describe the cocktail making robot because that was absolutely hilarious. Uh, uh, yeah, go into further detail about the robot. Okay, uh, if you check more detail, <laughs> you're loving it. I can hear him laughing. Uh, 
yeah, so uh, the website is cosmobotdrinkbot.net. You can see links to all the videos and stuff. I was on the Discovery Channel a bunch of times. Uh, so I want to do something with robots. One of the things I, I love is robotics, and the Robo Games is a big event here in the Bay Area. I've been photographing them for like, I don't know, eight years. And finally I said, damn it, I want to make a robot. So what I did was instead of just like a Balabot robot that fight, there's so many people doing that, and it's kind of expensive. I thought, well, let's do something different. And then I discovered there's this festival of cocktail robotics. I'm not joking. It's called Robo Exotica. It's in Vienna, Austria. And it's like this whole showcase of robots that are social, interacting with people, and they make drinks. So I thought, hmm, how can I, go, how can I combine space travel with drinks with robots? Hmm. And the Cosmobot was born. That's just a good question to ask in general. How can I combine <laughs> whatever it is I'm doing with drinking space? Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> if anyone ever wants to know how the why or how the robots take over the human race, they, they, this is where it begins: combining robots drinking in space. That's the that's the catalyst that makes it all happen. Well, and that's the same way that Yuri's made started. That's the way the best things start. With the, George and Loretta and and Trish got together and said. We like music and dancing in space. We should do something with that. And we should do it on Loretta's birthday. So that's how they picked <laughs> April 12th. And magically, now it's a worldwide space party. So I'm looking forward to worldwide domination by uh, outer space drinking robots. I think that would be okay with me. Uh, are you going to bring the, the drinking robot to 2011? Sorry, can you repeat that? So you're going to be drink bringing your drinking robot to New Space 2011, correct? Correct. You'll see the uh, Cosmobot over at the Party Lounge uh, at uh, New Space 2011. And that's another reason to, jo to go to the New Space Conference. Um, you know, we've been talking a lot about the Space Shuttle and, you know, NASA and large space agencies. Uh, the Space Frontier Foundation's New Space Conference is a great way to see kind of some of those smaller companies and what they're doing. And it's amazing if you put your mind to it, what you can accomplish with almost nothing. And uh, there's a lot of amazing innovation that you hear about and see, and it's a very motivational conference, I, I think. It's just one of those conferences where we walked out of it and we're like, that blew my mind. So if you can make it, it's, it's, it, first off, it's not that expensive, and it's in California, correct? The LA area? It's, a, it's at NASA Ames. It's at NASA Ames, and the banquet's going to be at a hotel in San Jose right nearby. So it's going to be uh, down south near San Jose. Yeah, if, if you can make it to the new space conference and you get to see the Cosmo, uh, Cosmo drink, Cosmo drink bot, Cosmo bot, Cosmo bot, uh, Cosmo bot. Uh, you, you get to see that in action. It has dry ice and everything. It's really cool. Uh, Sam, I wanted to thank you very much for uh, being on the program and uh, uh, sharing your knowledge and your robotics and your passion for space. All right, thank you guys. Today it was a lot of fun. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks so for having me on board.